FBI are like, bro, we're looking for people who are kidnapping children and you're sending us like weird hair that you found in the woods? F*** off. What was your name? About eight years ago, I applied for a job working at the military facility at Porton Down. Not me. I'd never do that. I'm not crazy. Like the they did at Porton Down. It's like they'd get people in there. That today, today's writer, Dave, did that. They'd get people in there and be like, have you tried cyanide? And you'd be like, no, I haven't. <laughs> What's cyanide? Because it's the 1940s or whatever. And they'd be like, and then some dude died or some sh It was crazy. Everything hurts and I'm dying. Porton Down is like the UK's biological and chemical weapons testing facility. I think. For those who don't know, this facility contains, among other things, a top secret science and military defense research program. So, to quote one of the questions I was asked during my interview, why did I apply for this job? First and most importantly, I was unemployed and I was poor. <laughs> it's so true, but it's not what you should say. It's like, so what, what interests you in this job? The money. And uh, I don't like being broke and I don't have a lot of experience, so it seemed perfect for me. <laughs> Secondly, I believe that my now admittedly out-of-date IT skills may be a prime candidate for the networking security role. However, the main reason was that, had I been successful, I would have received a fairly high-level security clearance, and I'm a nosy person who likes knowing things that other people are not allowed to know. Well, a security clearance doesn't suddenly mean that you could just go, like, log on to the other website and look at everything that's marked top secret. It just means that if you need to look at something top secret, then you can. It's not like you suddenly get access to, like, all of the world's secrets. You want to see my clearance? Let him play. Get the hell out of the way. For a number of reasons, chief among which was the fact that I'm absolutely terrible when it comes to being interviewed for work placements, I received neither the job nor the coveted security clearance that would have come with it. Fortunately for me, Simon is more interested in the proven quality of somebody's work rather than, say, the answer you might be able to come up with on the spot for the question, tell us about one time you went above and beyond in the workplace. And so I got this job instead. Yeah, I don't interview people. Like, I interviews, I hate interviews with such a deep passion that I don't think I've ever interviewed a single person. I'm just like, like, let's take Dave as an example. I don't remember how Dave and I got introduced, but Dave probably sent me an email and I was like, send me what you got, Dave. Show me your work. Let me see a portfolio. And Dave sends me a portfolio and I'll be like, that's rather good. And I'll be like, okay, cool. Do you want to write a little sample? And I'll pay for it. And Dave would probably be like, sure, I'll write a sample for you. And then he writes a sample. I'm like, well, this is rather good. And if it's not, then I'll pay for it and move on. But if it's rather good, I'll be like, great, let's make this into a full piece and I'll pay for that as well. And boom, done. Why do I need to interview someone? It's like, I don't need to know about some time they went above and beyond to the workplace. I just need to know whether their work is good. And granted, if I was hiring someone to be like, no, I'm never going to interview any interviews. <laughs> Huh? You're hired! You're hired, hired. Where? Oh god, yes, you're hired! Is this a job interview? Oh. Ever been caught in the rain without the right footwear? Well, soggy socks are no fun, but I've got the perfect solution for you, and that is today's fantastic sponsor, Vessi. Waterproof shoes that keep water out and let your feet breathe. It's basically magic. It's not magic, it's something called Dymatex, which is the technology that makes these shoes waterproof. They're not water resistant. There's, there's videos of me putting my feet into rivers and them staying perfectly dry because that's what Bessie does. Plus, they're also lightweight. Even this giant boot, which kept me very warm on a recent trip to Iceland, is lightweight. And it's just, it's it's well built, it's fully waterproof, it's got this incredible grip, you just cannot go wrong. Plus, Vessi uses vegan materials, so you're not just getting dry feet, you're making an eco-conscious choice too. So, good for you. And speaking of style, this is the Ulta, this is the one I took to Iceland. I was trying, to, I, I normally try to keep them like nice and clean for my ad reads. And uh, I just was like, oh, I really need some warm shoes because I'm going snowmobiling in Iceland for the weekend. <laughs> Although there wasn't any snowmobiling because <laughs> it wasn't cold enough. They were like, there's no snow. We don't know what to say. Uh, but people were like, Simon, it's it's nice because it shows you actually wear them. Oh, hold on. <laughs> you want to see some really worn Bessie shoes? I wore these for, and I, I still wear these occasionally. Like, <laughs> honestly, I'm not sure if like showing past best shoes on the on an advert is the best, but I wore these constantly for two years. I mean, look at this. I literally wore down the sole from wearing them so much. And they still look, I mean, they're not like top notch condition, but for a shoe that I wore basically constantly for two plus years, that's pretty amazing, right? And then there's the Soho. It's got a sleek synthetic leather exterior, making it suitable for every occasion. And don't get me started on their overcast jack. It's 100% waterproof. It's got a relaxed fit, an adjustable hood. Do you want to see that as well? Shall I grab that? It's just super nice. It's got this nice hood. It's got all that stuff. I also have to talk about their waterproof gloves, which I totally left at home. So I'm really sorry about that. And they're touchscreen compatible, which is also nice. It completes your Vessi look. So... 
Look, just go get yourself some Vessies. It's not that hard, is it? Don't waste any more time. Go to Vessie.com slash Blaze and pick yourself up a pair ready for your next city escapade. Or go to Vessie.com slash Blaze for 15% off your first order. Free shipping to Canada, the US, Australia, Japan, Taiwan, South Korea, and Singapore. That's a lot of places. Thank you to Vessie for sponsoring, and now back to today's video. As a quick aside, the blind and visually... Uh, what I'd rather do is, like, if I did need someone to take, like... I don't know, I, I, it's like I'm not, I don't run some giant company or anything. Oh no, I have interviewed some people. I have, I lie, I lie. I have done it, but it was five minutes over the phone. You're hired. As a quick aside, the blind and visually impaired community are notorious for being unemployed, usually because employers are not prepared to take a gamble on their workplace skills. So thanks for that, Simon, you legend. Well, you're welcome. I mean, I just don't give a shit. Like, if the work is good, the work is good. It's not complicated, is it? <laughs> Although I did not get the job, it did not change the fact that I'm interested in classified information. It just meant that, like the rest of you, I have to wait for it to become declassified before I can read it. While this is not quite as fun, it can still be incredibly interesting as you'll find out today. Ooh, are we diving into declassified information? I like this. I probably came up with this idea, because uh, a while ago, I had an idea to start a channel called Declassified, which just looks through all of the most like recently declassified files, because there's like a time period and different countries release all the different declassified files. You're joking. Not another one? Oh, for God's sake, I can't honestly, I can't stand this. And I was like, that sounds awesome, just to like dive through all the stuff that's recently been declassified. And then I realized that it would be a research nightmare because there's a lot of stuff and most of it's incredibly boring. Maybe ChatGPT could help. Just be like, here's a 700 page document. Anything interesting inside ChatGPT? And it'd be like, I found on page 697 a reference to aliens. Ooh. Ooh. And then you go look at page 697 or whatever, and it's like, yeah, illegal immigrant aliens. You know, like, oh yeah, of course. <laughs> There's no aliens, they're not real. What? Bro, what are you talking about, man? The NSA ANT catalog, or maybe it's pronounced ant catalog. We've all seen movies where our hero has to sneak into a top secret facility and plant some sort of gadget that will allow an outsider to hear or see what's going on, or in some cases, even hack into highly secure computer systems. But exactly how realistic is this? Do those spy gadgets have any sound basis in reality? Yes, definitely. People definitely hack into it, and then you, you hear about this. I mean, if it's been caught, if they've been caught. Generally, like, if the NSA's hacked, <laughs> well, Snowden and all that. Well, it wasn't a hack, it was just like data being taken out of it or whatever. I saw that movie. What well, an incredible movie. Was it called Snowden? Whatever it was called. Legend. Um, what was I talking about? I've completely forgotten. Let's just move on. Well, it turns out, yes, yeah. According to FactRepublic.com, the NSA Ant Catalog is a 50-page classified document listing technology available to the NSA and other national security administrations for the purpose of cyber surveillance. The document was created in 2008 and it was made public in 2013. This document, which is something akin to a cross between a terrorist's Amazon wish list and an inventory of James Bond's junk drawer, contains some fascinating or terrifying, depending on your point of view, pieces of kit. Is this the one 2013 sounds about right for the Snowden leaks, doesn't it? about 10 years ago? So just what exactly are we talking about here? While a large amount of the stuff contained within the catalog would require complex and lengthy technical explanations, there are a few cool things that are both cool enough to keep the nerds happy and simple enough so that normal people don't go and click on another video. Please don't, I need your watch time, thank you. For example, the Cottonmouth series of implants are USB devices that provide a covert wireless bridge into a target network. They could be integrated into any USB plug. That's crazy. <laughs> What I think this means is that it allows, if there's a wireless network, you can just go plug this thing in and it'll create another wireless network that hijacks that wireless network so someone on the outside can just log in and get see all the data on that internal wireless network, right? I'm just guessing. Like, I don't know anything about technology, but that's what it sounds like, right? FBI, open up! <laughs> What I think this means, bearing in mind I mentioned earlier that a lot of my networking knowledge is out of date, is that the co any cotton mouth device, be it a mouse, keyboard, memory stick, etc., that is plugged into a computer would instantly provide non-encrypted wireless access to any network that the computer was connected to. Yes, if that device was also equipped with a 4G or 5G internet connection, then it would be possible to monitor everything happening on that secure network from anywhere in the world. Ah, okay, so it's not doing another Wi-Fi network, it's like broadcasting out on like 5G or whatever. Another, well, whatever. 3G 2013? What did we have back then? Another exceptionally cool toy comes in the form of what appears to be a standard USB or Ethernet cable. Although this cable is capable of transmitting any data that is sent through it, it is almost completely undetectable from a standard cable. That is, unless you're in the habit of dismantling
handling all of your cables before using them, so how does it work? Well, I tried to write an understandable description, but unfortunately, I feared that it would be only understandable by me, so I decided to use this one from ArsTechnica.com instead. Let me guess what this is. It's basically you've got a keyboard, right, that you get shipped from, like, so-and-so supplier, and it arrives at your company, and you plug it in. But inside the, like, cable or inside the USB bit that sticks into your computer is something that's key logging and then broadcasting it out somehow, right? These devices, charged by specially tuned continuous wave radio signals sent from a portable radar unit, operating at as little as 2 watts up to as much as 1 kilowatt of power in the 1 to 2 gigahertz range, sends back a data stream as a reflected signal, allowing the NSA's operators to tune in and view what's happening on a computer screen or even listening to what's being said in the room as they paint the target with radio frequency energy, as well as giving a relatively rough location of devices within the building for the purposes of track tracking or targeting. Okay, never mind. I think it was way too simple. This is way way more advanced. I'm like, oh, it's a little spy gadget that goes in a USB port. It's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> Don't remember, even 10 years ago, the NSA had technology that you can't even dream about. We have technology. So where can you get your hands on some of this kit? Is there a website you can go and order it yourself? Well, you may be genuinely surprised to hear that although the NSA doesn't actually sell any of these gadgets or pieces of software to the public, what a surprise, there is a website that might provide you with instructions on how to make them at home. The NSA Playset Project <laughs> encourages hackers and nerds to re attempt to recreate the things found in the catalogue and provide detailed instructions on how they did it. The Playset website introduction reads, In the coming months and beyond, we will release a series of dead simple, easy-to-use tools to enable the next generation of security researchers. Security researchers. We, the security community, have learned a lot in the past couple of decades, yet the general public is still ill-equipped to deal with real threats that they face from ev that they face them every day and ill-informed as to what is possible. Inspired by the NSA and catalog, we hope that the NSA playset will make cutting-edge security tools more accessible, easier to understand, and harder to forget. I just like this stuff about general public being unaware of like cybersecurity and just general security in general. I'm just kind of like, I just got to assume that whatever you're doing, <laughs> just like someone's going to be watching. It's just, you get, <laughs> right? Because <laughs> it, it feels very like Orwellian, doesn't it? But it is like, you never know. Like people, and it doesn't feel like, like a crazy paranoid person to say it, but it's like, yeah, anything you do, someone could probably hack in and see that. It's like, I'm sure, like, I'm, oh, for a moment there, I was like, probably being watched by a camera right now. And it's like, well, obviously, fact, boy, you're filming a video. But there's got to be a hundred cameras in my office. Like, one, two, there's two on each set. Then there's, like, a webcam. There's probably, like, 19 cameras in my phone, on the iPad. That monitor up there probably has a webcam in it. You know, it's everywhere. It's crazy. I'm watching you, Wazowski. Always watching. Whew, she's nuts. Four products that resulted from this collaboration were demonstrated at DEF CON 22. That is a serious hacking convention for all of you non-nerds. Yeah, a friend of mine goes to that. Isn't it in Vegas? He's like not even a particularly computer tech person. He just finds all this sh fascinating. So he goes to the DEF CON conference every year. One of which was a GSM hacker that would allow the user to listen to mobile telephone calls. I won't list the actual website here because it may result in this video being demonetized. However, a quick Google for the NSA playset is all that is required if you're interested in finding out more. Assuming this site is not simply a technology version of the anarchist cookbook. I may very well have a go at making one of these devices myself purely for research purposes, you understand. If I do, I will post the results on my own channel, a link to which I shall post in the comment section. Assuming that Simon's okay with that, I'm definitely okay with that. Go for it. <laughs> What am I going to do? Like, ban you from the comment section? I'm going to ban... No, I'm just kidding. Dave, post it. It's fine. If you want me to put a link in the description... Um, this, this is incredibly inside baseball, but ask Wendy on Trello. <laughs> no one else cares. <laughs> Weaponized lightning. Anybody with even a basic knowledge of Greek mythology or indeed almost any kind of mythology involving gods will know that the lightning bolt is traditionally a weapon which can only be utilized by various fictitious entities. I don't know about any of you, but as far as I'm concerned, this limitation is a definite plus. So, just how unnerving would it be to discover that not only had the CIA been in discussion with outside scientists about potentially weaponizing lightning, but that it was, in fact, at least technically possible? I don't know. <laughs> Like, I don't think the uh, NSA or whatever is particularly interested in lightning striking me, but I imagine they're pretty interested in lightning striking terrorists. And terrorists? Just lightning strike the shit out of them. I'm like, okay, go for it. Like, as much bad shit as America does, I do generally view them as the good guys. Like, I know it's kind of like a meme and a trope, and it's like, well, they just go in and they fuck up countries, and they love war, and there's a military-industrial complex. But I'm like, yeah, but usually it's because there's, like, some positive end goal. Sometimes, maybe I'm just 
ignorant. I probably am. But I don't know. I'll be okay. If anyone's going to get lightning, I'd like it to be like America, Europe, Australia. <laughs> like one of those, one of the countries that I like from my cultural perspective. You're Will not cancelled! You're a criminal! PM. Putting it very simply, lightning is able to travel from the clouds to the ground because electricity can pass through ionized air. Once an ionized corridor known as a step ladder forms between a step leader, sorry, forms between the cloud and the ground, a circuit is created and the stored electricity can make the journey. Theoretically, if you used a couple of drones and a really, really long wire, you could actually not only cause lightning to strike, but choose the location of the strike with exceptional accuracy, which is cool. While that might seem to be more hassle than it's worth, it, yeah, because there's other weapons. It's like, why do you need to control lightning? It's not the 16th century. Just use a, like, laser-guided bomb. They're like, you could literally, it goes, it leaves a base, it flies up into space, and then it lands within like a centimeter of where it's supposed to on a terrorist's face or a civilian building full of children uh ah! that one didn't age quite so well the most obvious of the benefits over standard aerial attacks is that should you, for example, launch a lightning attack against an enemy building, it would be exceptionally difficult for your adversary to prove it beyond reasonable doubt. I mean, lightning strikes occur all the time. Yeah, but let's just run this through. So it's 2003, the US is marching up to Baghdad, and it's like, well, you know, we don't really want to attack Baghdad. Oh my god, look! Oh my god, lightning out of nowhere is just destroying all of the enemy targets! What are the odds? I mean, <laughs> that's beyond all reasonable doubt. And it's like, who has this lightning technology? Well, the guys at the gates! They're the only ones! You're hiding things from us. Nothing that concerns you. Personally, I think the benefit of controllable lightning strikes is far more psychological, and it's a good thing that the technology was not around during the inception of Catholicism. Even now, in a much more technologically advanced world, facing down an adversary who can quite literally turn the weather against you would be terrifying. Imagine how much more power any religious organization would have if they could secretly call down lightning strikes on those who displease them and then simply claim that it had been the work of God. Yeah, if that happens, I mean, I wouldn't. I'd just be like, well, they figured out some sciencey thing, haven't they? But people would be persuaded. Okay, so next, after this video, I'm going to work out, I'm going to get on that NSA playbook website, I'm going to make myself a lightning generator, and then start my own religion. Fortunately, for reasons that don't appear to be entirely clear, the development of this weapon was never widely pursued. Planned invasion of Cuba. Like everybody my age, I'm 35, if you're 35 as well, went to school in the UK and made the somewhat questionable decision of electing to attempt to G obtain a GCSE in history, then it is more likely that useful space, it, it's more like than likely that you useful space in your brain, which could otherwise be utilized to remember your own telephone number or something practical like that, is now taken up with random bits of information about the Cuban Missile Crisis. Well, I'll tell you what, I am. I'm not 35, I'm 36. I went to school in the UK. I'm pretty sure I got an A at GCSE history, and I don't think I studied the Cuban Missile Crisis, because there's different exam boards, right? And you get to choose which one, like there's OCR and AQA, how the fuck, Edexcel, how the f do I remember this? <laughs> I haven't thought about this in, like, literally 20 years. No! 20 years? 37? Young even more. 23 years. Jesus Christ, I'm getting old. No, I'm 36. It was exactly 20 years ago. Woo! Feeling young. One piece of information that you probably don't have, largely because at the time you were studying for your GCSEs, it was still classified, is that the Kennedy administration considered invading Cuba in 1962. The idea was so far along in the planning stage, there were even estimations for the amount of American casualties that there might be. In a declassified memo sent to Kennedy by Chief of Staff Maxwell Taylor, the casualty numbers were laid out as such. Provided that the Cuban forces use conventional weapons and not tactical nukes, holy sh Taylor wrote, Our medical plans are drawn up to accommodate about 18,500 casualties in the first 10 days of the operation. Good lord. However, if tactical nuclear weapons were used, there is no experience factor on which to base an estimate of casualties. As unwilling victims of history lessons will remember, that is not how it went down. I really liked... I really liked GCSE history. History was like one of my favorite subjects. Probably why I make all videos about history, I guess. Soviet researchers allegedly used rabbits to telepathically communicate with submarines. <laughs> oh god, the Cold War really spurred on some crazy sh**. 
in it. And what, in my opinion, is quite probably one of the best examples of leaking false information to your adversary in order to muddy the waters of truth, the Soviet Union appears to have convinced the CIA that they were able to use animals for telepathic communication. In a document that was produced in 1975 and declassified in 2004, the U.S. Army Medical Intelligence Agency lists a wide range of alleged successful telepathic, psychokinetic, and extrasensory perception tests carried out on animals between the end of World War II and the end of the Cold War. Now, there are many examples of these alleged tests, but for now, I think I'll just stick with one. Yo, if you need, like CIA, listen, listen. If you need someone on your staff to be like, yo, no, don't even think about it. The Soviets are, or like Russia's like leaking this thing. It's like we're using rapids. I'll be like, no. CIA, hire some more skeptical people, please, come on. The document claims that in 1956, Soviet scientists were able to prove that rabbits could communicate telepathically from miles and miles away. What's up, dude? Glad to see there's another brother in this stuff. So, um, this is, um... The way that they conducted this experiment was fairly simple, if a little gruesome. If you wish to attempt this experiment yourself, you will need one female rabbit with a new litter of kittens, one set of electrodes, one computer capable of using those electrodes to monitor the mother's brain activity, one submarine, and somebody who is willing to euthanize baby rabbits. <laughs> Bro, don't try this at home. Wasn't there a TV show called Don't Try This at Home? I feel like there was a TV show like that and they'd all trial these experiments i mean not like this but like the experiments that you couldn't do at home fascinating tangent simon let's carry on so what did they do allegedly the mother was removed from her kittens shortly after they were born and placed in a box with brain monitoring electrodes attached after this the kittens were taken aboard a submarine and transported far out to sea before the submarine completely submerged at perfectly timed intervals each of the kittens was euthanized and the exact time was noted down when these times were compared with the recording of the mother's brainwave activity the data showed brainwave spikes at the exact time that each of her kittens died that is up. Fortunately, it never happens, because obviously nonsense. You may be interested to hear that although I looked extensively, I was unable to find any reputable, successful replication of these findings. What a shock. However, it's probably definitely true. Why else would the information have remained classified for 29 years? <laughs> I don't know, Dave. Maybe because it, looks, it makes the CIA look a little bit silly. FBI file on Bigfoot. According to a genuinely splendid book, A Higher Loyalty, by former FBI director James Comey, one of the unofficial maxims of the organization that comes up when deciding whether or not something should be investigated is, did it happen on Earth? <laughs> because of this... <laughs> The FBI's jurisdiction doesn't extend to space, then, does it? I don't think the FBI's jurisdiction extends much far out of America, to be honest. Because of this somewhat wide-reaching jurisdiction, the FBI has, shall we say, quite a few files on quite a few individuals. This in itself isn't particularly surprising. After all, the Earth is a big place. However, what you may be... Oh, I guess they could be, like, tracking. But then, once they go abroad, isn't that what the CIA does? Or, like, Interpol? The F FBI doesn't, like, go to another country, does it? I don't think I've seen that movie. Everything I know about American law enforcement is always just from the movies. <laughs> However, what you may be surprised to hear is that in 1970s, they opened a file on Bigfoot. In 1976, director Peter Byrne of the Bigfoot Information Center, an exhibition in the Dales, Dallies, Dales, in Oregon, sent a small number of mystery hairs that he believed came from Bigfoot to the Bureau and asked them if they could possibly take some time out of their very important day and attempt to analyze them. FBI are like, bro, we're looking for people who are kidnapping children and you're sending us like weird hair that you found in the woods? F off. What was your name? off peter you c**k, in my opinion he also asked the bureau whether they had any previous encounters with the legendary beast and whether or not they had come across any of his hair according to history.com this is what happened next Jay Cochran Jr., assistant director of the FBI's Scientific and Technical Services Division, wrote back to Barn that he couldn't find any evidence of the FBI analyzing suspected Bigfoot hair and that the FBI usually only examined physical evidence related to criminal investigations. Still, it sometimes made exceptions in the interest of research and scientific inquiry. And Cochran said that he'd make such an exception for Byrne. Unsurprisingly, Cochran found that the hair didn't belong to Bigfoot in early 1977. He sent the hair back to Byrne along with the scientific conclusion, the hairs are of dear family origin. Although the file seems to have remained open for about 40 years, there is no evidence to suggest that the FBI actually gave the matter any more serious consideration. In fact, it seems more likely that on the day that the hair was received, Jay Cochran Jr. was bored and decided to waste a little time humoring the crazy Bigfoot man. And that, ladies and gentlemen, brings us to the end of this episode. Oh. Normally I don't get an, a, an outro like this. Normally I'm just like, bye. Incidentally, I have about 20 more entries, all researched and ready to go. So if you want to see more of them, then share this video with everyone you know and increase that sweet, sweet watch time. Tell you what, 
It's just gonna matter. If this video gets lots of views, we'll make it again. If it doesn't, we won't! Yes! That's my capitalist heart beating, and thanks for being here. Oh no, I have interviewed some people. I have- I lie. I lie. I have done it, but it was five minutes over the phone. You're hired!